Hi, I'm Brooklyn. Thanks for tuning in to Faith Community Online. If you haven't already, take a moment to click the red subscribe button so you're the first one to know the next time we post a video or podcast that will help you connect, grow, and lead right where you're at. And if you'd like to know more about getting connected at Faith Community, stick around at the end for all the ways to do that. We hope you're encouraged to take your next step as you move from where you are to where God wants you to be. Well, I am so excited to be with you this morning. Um, I wanted to introduce you to my family really quick, and, uh, and I have a picture of them. We recently were in uh, Hawaii. We were on the island of, uh, let's see, where were we? I don't even know what the island's name is, but we were in Honolulu. How about that? We were in Honolulu and had the chance to go there. And, and so I wanted to introduce you to my family. My wife there is kind of, let's see, one over from the gal on the right. That's my daughter. And uh, my wife is named Gretchen. We've been married over 20 years. And my daughter is, the, the oldest is over there. Uh, her name is Svea. She's 19 years old. Uh, and she is our kids pastor at our church. And so we're blessed to have her a part of the team. And, and uh, then my wife is also on staff uh, and helps me lead the church. And then my son is Caleb. He's 16 years old. And um, he's actually right here in the front row. Uh, so good to have him as my armor bearer today in Jesus' name. And, uh, and then finally, my daughter, Evie. Uh, she's the one in the middle. Her name is Evie, and she's 13 years old. Now, I don't know if you've had a chance to ever go to Hawaii. Has anybody been to Hawaii? Some of you out there? Some of you are like, I don't have the money to go to Hawaii. I can tell you that. I can tell you the same thing. Like, that place is expensive. In Jesus' name, it's expensive. And, uh, but I'll tell you, it was a bucket list thing for my wife. And, and so we decided to make the trip and had a great time. And we were in Honolulu and then we were in Maui and it was just a beautiful place. And, and, uh, but, but I wanted to kind of share with you something that happened. So like when we left, um, we obviously had a flight that, that was going to take us back to the States. And, and so what happened is we fly uh, inner islands. We went from, we went from Maui to Honolulu, right? Everything was great. Honolulu to LA in LA. We you know, made it there fine. It was great. No problems. But then we end up taking the trip from LA to Dallas, right? Stay with me, Dallas. So we get close to Dallas and they come on the radio and, and the pilot says, Guys, we're not able to land in Dallas right now because there's a storm. So the storm has developed. And so you know what they say. I mean, they say, well, we're going to have to circle a little bit. Everybody say circle. <laughs> so we had to circle a little bit. And, and so I don't know. I've circled before, but I've never circled this many times. And so we ended up having to circle four times. And, and so, you know, you make the first circle, make the second circle. You're like, please, God, would you just let us land? Nope, make the third circle. And you're thinking, it's got to be on this circle, right? No, no, we got one more. So we, we circle four different times. And that's probably like, I don't know, like two hours, you know, that you're up there just circling around. Have you ever been like in a place where you just wanted to land? You were tired of circling? You were tired of making that loop? And I don't know about you, but I was tired of circling. And then the pilot comes on and he says, what are they called? Uh, flight attendants. I, I was going to say stewardess. That's not the same word. That's, I'm older. Uh, so flight attendants, prepare the cabin for landing. And you're like, oh, thank God. And so, so, so we start to, to make our way down to, to Dallas. And, and then we're like, we're so close. And as we come in for the landing, he's like, no, it's too stormy. And he pulls back up. And so we're like going back up. And so they say, well, well, guys, we're not going to be able to land in Dallas. They're going to have to divert us all the way to Austin. And so we end up going all the way to Austin. We sit on the tarmac in Austin for about two hours. Yeah. Isn't this good? You're having a great, I'm having a great time. My family's having a great time. You know, you just want to be home. You ever had that habit? You're like on your way home. And so finally we leave Austin and we end up getting Back to Dallas, but we actually missed our flight. You know, we missed our connecting flight. And the only flight we could get was six hours later. So we hang out in Dallas for six hours waiting on our next flight. We eventually get to St. Louis 
And guess what? I've lost the key to my car. <laughs> uh, so if you ever need a key fob made, I've got the best guy in St. Louis. So just ask me about it because I thought I was going to get hammered, right? Because you know that's going to be expensive. I found a guy that could do it real cheap. But anyway, he came out two hours later. I'm able to get in my car and uh, get my family in there and we get home and we finally make it home. Oh. I tell you what, circling is not fun. Being in a process, being in the in-between, you know? When you're trying to go from A to B, that kind of in-between time sometimes can get hard. And the thing that I've learned is that most of us don't enjoy that circle. Most of us don't enjoy that circling over the place that we really want to be. And the truth is, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm kind of like, and I think our culture's this way, that we're kind of like a microwave culture. Like we want things now, don't we? Like we want them fast. You know, like, I mean, have you ever like put something in the microwave and think it was taking too long? You got problems. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a problem there because it used to be like it would take like three hours, but you're like, you're like getting it in like 10 seconds. So you're like, it's so, this is taking forever. It's true. We want things now. But guys, I just want you to know that God is not a microwave God. He's just not. Spiritual strength does not happen quickly. You're not going to become more like Jesus through a drive through You with me? It's not going to happen in a microwave. See, because the thing I've learned about God over my years of serving him is that God is not usually if ever in a hurry, he's just not. And so what you need to understand about our God is that he's usually a crock pot kind of God. He's going to marinate it. He's, there's going to be some time put in some effort, some soaking for you to become, because look, how in the world do we become like Jesus overnight? It's just not going to happen, but we need to understand that we serve a God that wants to bring those kinds of things into our life. But the truth is, is sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes circling. You know what I mean? Sometimes it takes some perseverance. And so today I want to share with you a story out of the Bible. This is in Joshua, Joshua chapter six. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Joshua chapter six, and I'm going to start in verse one and it'll be on the screens behind me, but I do want to kind of give you some context to what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, Moses was the leader of Israel. And so Moses had led Israel for a good while. Most people believe that he wrote the first five books of the old Testament. And right after those first five books, there's a book called Joshua. And what's happening in that season, so to speak, is that Joshua was like an assistant to Moses. He was like his assistant. And he followed Moses around. He did what Moses needed him to do. Uh, he, he was with Moses when he was interacting with God. I mean, he learned so much by just being with him. Now, I don't think Joshua knew at that time that he was gonna be the next guy, that he was gonna be the person that was gonna lead Israel into the promised land. But the reality kind of comes together and Moses is not going to be the one that leads them into the promised land to receive the promises that God had brought. And so Joshua takes over. He becomes the new leader and God promises to Joshua that he's going to be with him. Matter of fact, he says that I want you to be strong and courageous. And he keeps repeating that over and over again because he knows the work that he has for him is not going to be easy. But God promises to be with him. God promises that I will be with you, that I won't forsake you. And if you'll stay close to me and do what I tell you, you're going to be all right. And so that's kind of what's happening as we get to this place in Joshua. God has already done some of that. And, and so I want to kind of give you that context. But then also one of the things you need to know about what's going on in Israel is that Israel is coming out of the desert and God is going to start to do a few miracles to get them in a place to actually take over the land 
that God has for them. And so what you read in the Bible is that God literally parts the Jordan River. Like he, he literally parts it and the people of God walk over. And this is, this is a, a really cool kind of like geeky moment for me. Like when you see like these things in the Bible and you're like, oh, that's good. That's good. But it says that they walked over on dry land. And it keeps saying it like multiple times. And it, 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 I don't know. Like some of you are like are not wowed enough as far as I can tell. But, 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 but I mean, the parting of that river is pretty amazing. But if, if you know, like rivers, I'm pretty sure that it would be wet. Lots of mud. If you're trying to get your chariots over, it, it, you'd get stuck in the mud. But what I love about this is the Bible says that God dried that land. So not only did he part the sea or this, this river, he dried the land and they literally come across. I mean, what a miracle, what an amazing thing that God did. And then there are a couple of other things that God does to get them ready. And right here, right now, they're sitting on the eve of conquering, or let me say it this way, of attacking the first city, which is Jericho. So as they come in, they're about to attack Jericho, taking that city to begin their journey to receive and take over the land that God had promised them. Yeah. Let me read this to you. In Joshua chapter six, starting in verse one, listen to these words. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went in and no one came out. Okay, so, so what's happening is they've shut the entire place up because they know that there's this, this group of people that are about to attack their city. Because Israel has come, they've shut the place down. Listen to this in verse two. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hands with its kings and its valiant warriors. Did you notice that this is on the eve of the battle and God says, I have given. Do you notice the present tense? They haven't even attacked the city. And God says, I have already given it to you. And what he's asking them to do is to believe it and then step towards it in faith. So he says, I have already given Jericho into your hands. It's king and it's valiant warriors. And then he says this in verse three, you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling. Everybody say circling. All the men of war circling. And then he says this. The city at once. You shall do so for six days. Okay. If I was the general. And God said to me. I've got a strategy for you. Here's the strategy. I want you to circle the city. I want you to walk around it. Matter of fact, I don't want you to walk around it three times. I want you to walk it around it one time every day. So people of Israel go out and they walk around the city one time and they go back to camp and they wait <laughs> and then they do it again and then they do it again. Oh, and they do it again. They do it again. And then they do it again, right? That's the strategy. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be like, God, this doesn't seem like a great strategy to me. I mean, I've got some generals here. We could drop some plans, start making some ramparts, getting some things to sling it over. You know, I mean, we could do some stuff here to, to help you. But God says, look, this isn't about you. Listen to this. I love this. It's something that sometimes we miss. He tells him to do it six times. Six is the number of man. It's our own effort. It's our own effort. And if the walls would have come down on the sixth day, it would have said that man was enough. But they came down on the seventh, which is the number of God. 
And rather than walk around it, what did, they, what did he tell them to do? He told them to shout. And they shouted. And the Bible tells us that the walls came down. Guys, this isn't just a cool, cute kid's story. Even though it's cool. It's a real deal. It's something that happened in history. It's something that God did. Because let me tell you this. When God says he's going to do something, <laughs> he does it. When God makes a promise, he fulfills it. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes we can get to a place in our life where we wonder if he's actually going to come through. Yes, we've been waiting a while. Maybe we went circling a while. And we get into these places where we wonder if God is actually going to come through on the promise that he said he was going to give us. And you may be there today. And it's hard. It's hard when you're trying to fulfill what God has told you to do. And he says to you, I need you to take another lap. Now, here's the deal. God doesn't tell us to circle because he needs us to. God doesn't tell us to circle because somehow we're working our way to get him to love us. Or somehow if we circle enough that maybe just maybe God will give us good candy. It has nothing to do with that. See, what God is interested in is not our comfort, but our character. And the way that God builds our character is oftentimes in the perseverance. It's in the circling. It's in those times that we don't see the promise of God yet. And God calls us to do a little circling like he did the people of Israel. Do you see what I'm saying? I want to share with you a few thoughts on this. Because we see very clearly in the Bible that, that God is moving and working. And, and he wants to deliver these things into our life. And, and what I've found is sometimes the promises of God aren't happening in my life. But the reality is, is the reason they're not happening is because I haven't grabbed hold of them. Now, that's not always the case, but I can tell you sometimes it is. Matter of fact, I, I wonder sometimes if it's more than we think. Let me, let me, let me show you something I, I, I stumbled upon in Joshua 1.8. It'll be on the screen behind me, but, but I, I noticed something I'd never seen before. Look at this in Joshua 1. Joshua 1.8. The Bible says, the, this book of the law, let's say the word or the Bible, shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all, yes, all that is written in it. Let me, let me translate that. Do what it tells you to do is what it's saying. Meditate on it, observe it, know it, love it, chew it, but do it. Then he says this, look at this. For then, and this is the part I want you to see. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Did you notice that it says you will make? Did you see it? It doesn't say God. It says you will make. So, so, so what is he getting at? What's the point that, that Joshua is trying to help us to see is that there is a partnership that we have with God that requires us to do something with it. Now, God is the God of the promise. Yes, God is the promiser. So who gives the promise? God. But then notice who activates the promise. We do. So, so, so the scripture is very clearly saying that we make this. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that somehow we're God, because clearly we're not. Clearly we are not sovereign. Clearly we're not omnipotent or omnipresent or all the omnis. God is the one that makes the promise, not me. But God calls me into relationship. And it's in that relationship, come on, that my situation can change that my natural can become supernatural. Come on. That my possible or my impossible can become possible. Because God is able to do what he says he's going to do. His promises are yes and amen to those that believe. 
It's truth. And, and what happens sometimes is we forget. How many of y'all forget? Anybody forget? You ever seen God do something miraculous in your life and then, you know, a year later you forgot? You're not even thinking about it anymore? There's a reason that one of the most mentioned words in the Bible is remember. Because apparently we forget. One of the reasons we do communion is it's a way for us to remember what Jesus has done for us. Because guess what? We sometimes forget. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you an illustration. So here's my praise box. Oh, no, my promise box. It starts with a P, guys. Stick with me. Here's my promise box. And in this promise box, there's all kinds of promises. All of these promises come from God. Now, let me say it this way. I don't know if you know this, but there are over 3,500 promises in the Bible. Everybody say, wow. That's a lot. And, 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 and what's amazing about these promises is often they apply to us. Often they have something to do with the relationship that we have with God. Now, some of those promises are all on God. Like he's going to do it because he said he's going to do it. But then there are other promises that he asks us to partner with him in faith. Did you know that the Bible says that the only thing that pleases God is faith? So God is looking for faith. God is looking for people in faith to believe that when he says it's possible, that when he says, this is the promise, that you don't say, really? But you say in faith, I believe you. And matter of fact, I'm going to stand on that even if I don't see it. And if I have to circle that, if I have to keep circling it, if I got to keep focused circling that thing, even when the enemy comes and tells me it's not true, I got to keep moving in faith, believing God that his promises are true by faith, even if I don't see him, even if I don't see him, come on, even if I don't see him, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. That's something that I used to sing when I, in a church I got saved in. Is it that I, he may not be there yet. He may say, take another lap, kid. But let me just tell you this. If God ever tells me to take a lap, he is a loving father and there's a reason. It may be hard. It may be difficult. But at the end of the day, I'm going to trust him because he is for me and not against me. Even if I can't see it. Come on, guys. The thing I've learned is that sometimes, listen to me. That sometimes there are promises on the table that I haven't picked up. Like I just haven't grabbed hold of them and picked them up in faith. And I don't know what yours is. But usually there's a promise attached to the thing you're cursing. You know what I mean? Like the thing that's making you mad right now. The thing that's upsetting you. The thing that you're wishing would go away. I guarantee you there's a promise there. That God is wanting to deliver into your life. And I don't know what it is, but I know God is there. The Bible says that he's with us in all of that, that he's pointing these things. He's showing us there are signposts that he wants us to see. And maybe today will just be the day that you say, you know what? I don't know what the promise is, but I'm going to find it. And I'm going to believe in faith that God is going to move in this particular area so that I can see this come to pass. So here's my question. What promise Okay, stay with me. What promise of God is sitting on the metaphorical table right now that God is asking you to activate by faith? What promise is sitting on the meta, the meta, I'll get it, I'll get it, metaphorical table that God is asking you to activate by faith? Now, this may be a little nebulous at this point because you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what the promise you're talking about. Maybe you don't, aren't familiar with some of the promises of God. Here's something that I'll share with you. So there's a promise in the Bible that says, if, if I will tithe, God says he'll overflow my cup. That's what he says. Go read it. It's in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter three says, if I tithe, God will overflow my cup. There's another promise in there that he says that when I honor him in this way, that he will rebuke the devourer off of my finances. 
That's what it says. Now, can I tell you a story? So this was several months ago, uh, and I had a pipe break in my basement. Y'all ever had that happen? Holy moly. That's horrible. It backed up. Come on. Was not good. So a pipe broke in my house, and uh, it's also, those tend to be pretty expensive. And I tell you, I was struggling. I was like, God, you told me in your word <laughs> that you would overflow my cup. And right now it feels like my cup has a leak. And I remember I was, I was struggling and I was on my way to meet with somebody. And uh, I had just found out that it was going to, the person that quoted it to me, that was going to give me, they were like, it's going to be probably about $8,500. I'm like, <laughs> right? Some of y'all are like, no problem. But, but for me, guys, preacher man here, that was a lot. And so $8,500, I'm thinking about this and I'm praying and I'm saying, God, you said in your word that you'd overflow my cup. You said you'd, you would rebuke the devourer. And so I'm circling. Come on. I'm, matter of fact, I'm running around that thing. I'm circling hard. And I'm saying, God, I, I need you to do something. So I, what's crazy is I meet with this guy. I, I have coffee with this fella. And he says, hey, I got a friend. I'm like, oh, you got a friend. And the friend apparently was somebody that could do things with basements and pipes. And I was like, oh, that's great. Can, can I talk to him? So this guy says to me, he says, yeah, here's his number. So I call the guy. Guy comes over, like almost immediately comes over and he says, oh yeah, I can do that for $2,500. Some of y'all, I don't know if you're seeing the miracle yet. Now, $2,500. This is so good. So $2,500, God does, gives this, brings this guy into our life. He's going to do it for $2,500. And I, I say, God, thank you. You know, thank you. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for being true to your word. But I have another question, Lord. You said you would rebuke the devourer. And that's still $2,500. <laughs> now, I, guys, hear me. I was thankful. I was thankful. But I was like, I'd like to see you do a little more for me. Could you do that for me, God? I'll make this short. A guy I'd met with probably six months ago before this felt in his heart that him and his wife were supposed to send Gretchen and I $2,500. And he gave it to me that week. Now, some of you were like, oh, coincidence. Maybe, fine, you skeptics get it. But $2,500 exact amount. God is a God who is faithful to his promises. He calls us by faith to circle and trust him even when we don't see it. To stand on his word. And I'm not saying that's going to be your experience. I'm just simply sharing my testimony of what God did in my life. And I tell you this, guys, we need to start circling some promises. I don't know what your promise is, but I want to share just a few. I just have a little time and I, I want to share a few promises with you. Here are just a few. Number one, God will guide you. Did you know that? That God will guide you. Some of you are looking for guidance today. You're thinking, I, am I, do I need to go here? Do I need to do this? Do I need to marry this person? Do I need to take this job? You're wondering. You're trying to figure it out. Listen to the word of God. Psalm 48, and there are many more. Psalm 48, 14 says this, for that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever, and he will guide us until we die. The Lord will guide you. That is his promise to you. Amen? And some of you need to circle that. You need to start praying. You need to start seeking. You need to start persevering in that and watch what God will do. Number two, God will rescue you. Come on, somebody here today needs to be rescued. You are in a pit. You've made some decisions that have put you in a hole. And you're asking God for help. God doesn't always remove the consequences, but he always will rescue. He always will rescue. And right now, some of you are trying to do it on your own. And God is saying, hey, take my hand. Because I can tell you, your problem without God is worse. 
You need God right now. And you need to reach out your hand and believe that you serve or could serve a God who rescues, a God who saves, a God who reaches into space and time and does something for his kids, for his creation, because he loves you. Would you circle that promise today? Number three, God is with you. Look at this in Deuteronomy 31. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For somebody today, that's enough. Do not be discouraged. You might be disappointed, but don't be discouraged because you serve a God that can. You serve a God that is more than able. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. Woo! He will be with you. He will neither fail you or abandon you. Come on. For some of you football people out there, Anybody? Maybe one. I know the Rams left. Just relax. Come on, y'all. But in football, there's a, a guy named the running back. You ever heard this guy? He runs the ball typically. Well, in older models of football, there was usually a guy in front of him that wasn't the quarterback. It was called the fullback. And the fullback's job was to make holes for the running back. So the fullback would go forward and the running back would follow him, right? And what the Bible is saying is that God is the one that goes before us. You starting to get it? If you're running the ball, you need a fullback. You need somebody running through the line. And what's so good about that is that the Lord says he'll clear the path for you. The Bible even says that even in the desert, when you see no roads, God is able to make roads. God is able to make paths where there are no paths. Some of you are looking out right now and you're thinking to yourself, where is the path? But God says, I'll help you. I'm with you and I will help you find that path and you'll be able to go towards what you need to go towards. Number four, God hears you. Did you know God hears you? I love the fact that the Bible says that when I pray, God hears my prayers. You may right now feel like when you're praying, God's not listening, but let me tell you this. The Bible is very clear that God hears every prayer you've ever prayed. Every prayer. He may not always answer it the way that you want, but I can tell you this, he hears you. And you know, one of the good things I've read in the Bible is that not only does God hear us, the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and works them in a way that they get to the Father's ear even if we prayed bad things, like selfish things. You ever prayed a selfish prayer? Come on. God of the almighty smiter, would you smite this person today? I know none of you have ever done that, but I thank God that the Holy Spirit takes my prayer, reworks it, and delivers it to the ear of the Father, and the Father hears the prayer the way it needs to be heard, and then he delivers us to the promise by faith that we need to receive. I love that it's dummy proof. Even when I mess it up, God is able to work with it because not, God's not asking us to be perfect. He's asking us to be faithful. He's asking us to be people of faith that trust him with our lives. A couple of more. God will provide all your needs. Whew. God is your source, friends. And sometimes in our life, we'll start to believe that our husband or our wife or our friend or our job are our sources. And we put our faith and trust in those things. And I just need you to know that is a sinking sand. It's a sinking sand. Because guess what? They'll always let you down. But you can always trust that God will follow through. He is an unending source that will never let you down. Now, some of you are struggling to even believe that right now. I'm asking you to believe it. I'm asking you to press into it and see what God has for you on the other side. Do some circling around that idea. See, God has given you authority. Did you know that? God has given you authority. You have authority that I think sometimes we live down here and God is saying live up here. You are a son or daughter of the most high God. If you're a follower of Jesus today, that's what the scripture says. And if you're not, you can be. But the Bible says if you're a son or daughter, then live like a son or daughter. 
Live in the authority that God has given you. Circle that promise, not like this. God, I just believe, I think, I think, I think. I'm just going to do it. You know what I mean? No, you get in there and you say, I believe in faith, God, that you are true to your word. I stand on the promise. I stand on the fact that your word says that the, that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And so as I'm circling this promise, I'm going to believe God to do the miraculous, even though I don't see it all the time. God wants you to see it today. Come on, people. God wants you to see it. Get your, get your faith up today. I want to put some heart into you. I want you to get some, I want you to believe again. Somebody here today needs to believe again that God is able. He's able in your circumstance. And then lastly, number seven, God has given us peace. How many of us know we need some peace in our lives today? How many of us know we need some peace in our, in our country? We need some peace in our nation. We need some peace in this world that seems out of control. But you know what I love about God's peace? God's peace comes to us even if there's conflict. So let me say it this way. In the midst of conflict, there's peace. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So in other words, when you get Jesus, you get peace. Not in some canister of peace where you get to drink it. No, no, no. You get Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you have peace. And what happens sometimes is we forget that. And so in the midst of the chaos of your life right now, you need to remember again that if Jesus is in you, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're not going outside of yourself to find peace. You're finding peace inside of you because the promise lives in you. And your job is to get some faith and start to believe God again that that peace can come to your life. So let me say it this way. Divine sovereignty is not a substitute for human responsibility. God partners with us. God is still sovereign. If God says it, it's true. If he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. But at the end of the day, he calls us to be a part of it. He calls us to participate. And my heart is that you would start to participate maybe just a little bit. Some of you is like, I, I can't give you a lot because circling sounds hard, Pastor. Give me a little bit. God says he can work with faith. What? Size of a mustard seed. You just take a step in faith and see what God will do. You trust him in some area that he's told you to trust him and see what God will do. He will always, always be faithful to his word. Take a step today. Move towards him. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. I love this. Charles Spurgeon was talking about Joshua and he said it this way. He says, Joshua was, was not to use the promise as a couch upon which his indolence might luxurate. Isn't that good? What he's saying is, so you'd sit on the couch and do nothing. Okay. He wasn't to use the promise of God for doing nothing, but as a girdle wherewith to gird up his loins for future activity. Do you see it? That we, that he wasn't supposed to lay on the couch and just relax. If God has saved you, you have a job to do. If God is working in your life, if, if God has saved you, then your response is to live your life for him. His salvation is a free gift. All it requires is that you put your faith and trust in him. And maybe somebody here today has never done that. Like maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in God. And I just want to say it is not an accident that you're here today. The sovereign hand of God is on your life. And he is calling you to himself now. And for some of us today, we've already felt that. We've already experienced that. We've already come into that encounter. And I'm just simply asking us to gird up our, um, our loins. That our faith would be strong. Recognizing that God has some work to do. See, God's promises are prods. They're not pillows. They don't call us to take a nap. Even though sometimes naps are good. They really do call us to stand 
and to move towards them and to actively circle them when necessary and believe God. And so I just ask you, what promise is sitting on the metaphorical table that God has asked you to circle? Just start with one. If you're like, that list was too big, Pastor, just start with one. And Jen, watch your faith grow and watch God begin to do what only he can do. As I close, one last promise. You've probably heard this one. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. What an amazing promise. God gave his son and says to you, do you notice God gave it? I love that God's a giver. Gave his son. And he says, if you'll accept it, if you'll accept it, that it will change your eternity. But in addition to that, he'll begin the process of transforming you from the inside out. That as you continue on a long journey of obedience towards God, you'll eventually become and start to look more like Jesus. And the world will see it. And they'll be called and drawn to a God that loves them. Come on. I want to pray for you. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for every person in this room. And I thank you that your word reminds us that the promises of God are yes and amen. They're true. It is true that sometimes, God, you invite us to, to circle a little bit. Sometimes a lot. And it gets hard. But today, for anybody in the room today, I just want to pray for you. If you feel like you want to renew your commitment, just say, God, I want to renew my commitment to you. I'm going to circle that promise today. I'm going to move towards that promise. But I do want to pray for anybody here today as I read that scripture from John. I want to pray for anybody here that would say, I don't have a relationship with God. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. As a matter of fact, I felt like you were talking to me. I wonder if you want a relationship with Jesus. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, that he'll come and he'll save you. And he'll begin that relationship. And so right now with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you a question. Do you know him? And if you don't, I want to invite you to do something as a statement of faith. Because I've learned if you can't raise it up here, you won't raise it up out there. And so right now on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as a statement of faith saying that you want to be included in this prayer. And so right now on the count of three, just raise your hand up. One, two, three. Go ahead. Hands going up. God bless you. Good. All over the room. God bless you. I love it. Jesus, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Go ahead and put your hands down. I want to I wanna say a prayer. If you'd like to be included in this prayer, there's nothing magical about this prayer. All I'm asking you to do is believe it by faith that it's true. Even if you don't feel it, that it's true. And you stand on that. And so church, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to lead you in a prayer. And I'd like everybody to pray with me. I don't want anybody praying alone. And so we're all going to pray this same prayer together. And so right now, I invite you to say this prayer with me, especially if you raised your hand. Heavenly Father, I need a Savior. Would you forgive me of my sins? Will you wash me clean? Change me from the inside out. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I choose to follow you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, guys. Let's celebrate those that were giving their life to the Lord. Come on now. Come on. All heaven is celebrating. The Bible says that angels are, are, are shouting. More and more coming into the kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, I want to invite you to stand on your feet. We're going to sing this last song together, and I want to invite our prayer team to come forward. And so they're going to be down here at the front. And during this song, if you'd like to be prayed for, if there's something stirring in you, if you need somebody to circle with you on a promise, 
Just go ahead and come and be prayed for as we sing together. This song is all about standing on the fact that God will never fail us. Do you believe it? Come on, church. Do you believe that today? That we serve a God that will never fail us. He will never leave us. He will never abandon us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, guys. Let's sing together. Hallelujah. on your promises and God we are not going to just remain but we are gonna move Jesus whatever it is you are asking us 
We believe in you, Jesus. And if we need to, we are gonna circle knowing that we're not alone. You're with us. You're going before us, Jesus, and you are setting the path. And so we trust you this morning. We thank you for what you have begun, what you will continue to do. And so I just pray that you continue to speak to us today. Jesus, we love you. And it's your promises that we stand and believe. And we know you are calling us to partner with you and we will see your word not return void. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you, so here are a few ways you can do that. If you're new here, or you made the decision to follow Jesus today, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000. One of our team members will follow up soon with details about how you can take your next step at Faith Community. We also believe that God cares about the needs going on in your life. So no matter where you're joining from, we would love to pray for you. Email prayer at faithcommunity.co with your prayer request. You can always learn more about the church at faithcommunity.co and stay connected on social media. Shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram to say hello. And finally, click the red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. Thanks again for joining us online today. We'll see you next time.